This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlock Holmes scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by supporters like you. For as little as a dollar a month, you can support the efforts here at Trifles. Just go to patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the problem was final, the house was empty, and his bow was last, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutiae? Why would the Pope engage Sherlock Holmes' services? Why did he receive the Legion of Honor from France? And why would he refuse a knighthood? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 320, The Erudition of Sherlock Holmes. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we get into the minutia of the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, I'm not sure whether to provide some introduction in some mellifluous language or to simply just, you know, like we always do. Yeah. yeah, just just you know. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll see you down at the student union, and we can discuss it over a game of billiards. Yeah, and a nosh, maybe. A nosh. <laughs> Who knows? Well, uh, this is the uh, monthly feature that we call Master's Class. We take a look at a piece of previous scholarship. And in this season, just to remind you, we are spending the first quarter, the first three months, on... Trevor Hall and his book, Sherlock Holmes, Ten Literary Studies. And this is one of those studies called The Erudition of Sherlock Holmes, all about how Holmes managed to get so highfalutin in various areas, where it came from, what the inspiration was, etc. The show notes for this episode, including perhaps a link to the Trevor Hall book, will be available at ihose.co slash trifles320. All lowercase. You can find that URL in your show notes. Uh, you know, when whatever podcast app you happen to be listening to us on, and that'll take you directly to the full page, which has all the background and ways to subscribe, and of course, ways to support trifles, including through Patreon. Take a look, root around there, see what works for you, and make sure you're signed up for updates on whatever format you prefer. You can get email updates from us from the website. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you happen to be listening. And we appreciate your support. All right, we're back in class, the master's class. And uh, we are trudging our way through Trevor Hall's Sherlock Holmes 10 Literary Studies. This is a really fascinating uh, little book. Uh, which contains essays of various length. And uh, the last time around these parts, we, uh, when we had our last master's class, we looked at the early years of Sherlock Holmes. And in some ways, this is a continuation of that discussion as we look at how Sherlock Holmes um, came to be the erudite man that he was. Yes, and just to remind our listeners, the idea of digging into these writers on a quarterly basis is to uh, present or a monthly you, basis. A monthly basis, right? Um, but a specific writer for a quarter, for you know, for a period of time, is to present you with the opportunity to to think about the the way they do this work. You know, what is the central idea of the essay? How does the author bring people along? Uh, do they have a unique style? And at the end, you know, ask yourself, gee, do I agree or disagree with uh, what this author has proposed? And we start right away in the erudition of Sherlock Holmes by 
Trevor Hall when he refers to Michael Harrison's thinking about Holmes's education. Hall says, boy, you know, Holmes had such an extraordinary mind. He must have had a superlative education. And Michael Harrison is quoted by Hall as saying, oh, not so, not so. I mean, think, think no more about his early cases, the Gloria Scott, the Musgrave ritual. Harrison says, you know, just look at the words that Holmes used. You know, he, he speaks of justice of the peace Trevor. And in the Musgrave ritual, he speaks of Butler Brunton. And his whole style of speech has numerous split infinitives. And they're not the only solecisms. He, he's, he irritates tactlessly his friend's father, who's also his host. All of this, says Harrison, makes us wonder what sort of man Holmes was to have escaped the refining influences of the university, whichever one it was. Oh, see, and and I know uh, Hall continues here with uh, Sir Sidney Roberts, S.C. Roberts, uh, taking issue with it. But I'm I'm just going to go off script here a little bit, and saying this isn't necessarily a Holmes problem. This is a Watson problem. Mm. Watson's the one that uh, wrote it up, mm. and I think to his readers, if he wanted to convey a sense of worldliness of this great detective that happens to be his his uh, companion and colleague, he would have worded it in a way that made Holmes come off better. And yet, I think Watson's poor writing skills are what's showing through here. <laughs> That's right. Watson's well, right. right? He, Holmes was telling Watson the story, and Watson was scribbling away, and he was sort of new at this. And, uh, you know, it could be that Holmes was exactly as eloquent as Harrison laments he was not. Yeah. And indeed, and indeed, Sir Sidney Roberts says, says Trevor Hall, points out, with the Trevors at Donathorpe or with the Musgraves at Hurlston Manor, Holmes was completely at home. And later on, he did not betray the slightest self-consciousness in dealing with clients such as the Duke of Holderness or the illustrious Lord Bellinger. So there you are, you know, a very different view. Yeah, and uh, it was clear that Holmes could go toe-to-toe with them, and he was equally at home in uh, waxing poetic or uh, waxing prosaic uh, with Watson in certain cases. Um, As as a matter of fact, uh, and and there's an interesting juxtaposition here, Uh, Watson quoted Thomas Carlyle, in, um, uh, goodness, this would have been in A Study in Scarlet early mm. on. Um, this is when he's establishing Holmes' ignorance of certain areas that, you know, Watson, quite frankly, finds astounding, uh, when in fact it merely indicates that Holmes takes his specialization very seriously. He doesn't want to clutter up his mind with other things. And uh, he quotes Thomas Carlyle and Holmes uh, inquires in the naivest way who he might be and what he had done. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know, the other side of that is that they are just getting to know each other, and that's why Watson is compiling this list of homes, you know, and his his merits and trying to understand what he knows and what he doesn't know. It could be that Holmes, who had a superlative education and who was very sophisticated, looked at this former army surgeon and found him just a little bit tiresome. And so rather than get into this distracting conversation about Carlisle or something else, he just said to himself, you know, the easiest way is to say, nope, nope, never heard of him. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And and, uh, Hall goes on to say uh, he was... uh, it's it's of the uh, first importance to remember, moreover, that uh, Samuel Johnson said that uh, knowledge is of two kinds. We know a subject ourselves, or we know where we can find information upon it. And Hall continues, he says, there can be no doubt that Holmes must have received an education on how to look things up, and that, that has seldom, if ever, been equaled. And... Let's not forget that that uh, profession of ignorance, and I'm using air quotes around ignorance here, in A Study in Scarlet, uh, 
was flipped on its head in the very next story in the sign of four when Holmes says how small we feel with our petty ambitions and strivings in the presence of the great elemental forces of nature are you well up in your Jean Paul and Watson says fairly so I worked back to him through Carlisle <laughs> and then Holmes says well that's like following the brook to the parent lake <laughs> so clearly he has some knowledge of Carlyle to understand the connection between Jean Paul, which is Jean Paul Friedrich Richter, and Thomas Carlyle. Mm. So it's a it's a clever dig, perhaps, at Watson outing Holmes as being ignorant of Carlyle when in fact Holmes knows Carlyle very well, or at least knew to look up Carlyle later and apply the knowledge. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, uh, you know, Hall takes us through some of these other dichotomies where Holmes's language and his knowledge of certain subject areas are at great variance to Watson's original poor assessment. So, uh, about, you know, he'd made great, Hall says he's made great progress in his knowledge of astronomy by 1882, one year after admitting he was even unaware that the earth moved around the sun. And Hall points us to the interchange from the Greek interpreter, where Watson says, you know, after tea on a summer evening, we'd had this conversation, roaming in all sorts of topics, from golf clubs to the causes of the change in the obliquity of the ecliptic. Uh, and then at last we came round to the question of atavism and hereditary aptitudes. Well, you know, that is, that is uh, you know, just remarkable. And then Hall says, well, you know, after leaving the university in 1874, Holmes, after all, came to London and had rooms in Montague Street just round the corner from the British Museum. And there, Holmes tells us, he was filling in his too abundant leisure time by studying all those branches of science which might make me more efficient. And so Holmes knew how to use the reading room of the British Museum some mm. years before Watson commented upon his remarkable ignorance in some respects. And so, you know, he clearly uh, focused on the branches of learning that Watson reported him to be very well informed in in 1881, botany and geology and chemistry and anatomy and sensational crime and British law. But Holmes clearly, you know, filled in the gaps in his knowledge of things like, you know, philosophy and astronomy, which Watson earlier said, well, you know, he knows nothing about them. That's right. And let's not forget that, you know, at, at a certain point, Holmes had no use for those particular things. And when it became apparent, uh, for example, uh, that he needed to know some kind of information, well, he would look it up. He certainly kept his own index. And as we mentioned, he was... Uh, a, a regular user of the uh, resources of the British Museum. And um, he, he says, um, yeah, it's clear, however, that the scholarly habit of using the resources of the British Museum learned by Holmes during his student days remained with him for as late as 1894. We see him spending a morning in the reading room looking up the history of voodooism. <laughs> that would have been from Wisteria Lodge. Mm. So, you know, clearly I mean, Holmes didn't have access to Google the way we do. Uh, the reading room was the uh, Victorian equivalent. And uh, Holmes, when necessary, when he couldn't find the resources in his own index or in his own brain attic, would uh, turn to that scholarly institution and he knew how to use it. See, we've never really dug into this research into voodooism and thought about what it might explain. I mean, Holmes is there in the reading room looking up the history of voodooism. Is it possible that Watson had irritated him at some point and that Holmes was actually constructing a small voodoo doll of an army surgeon and that he put a pin in both his shoulder and the leg. And that is why Watson's <laughs> wounds seem to move around. That explains it all. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Well, that's my job, not Trevor Hall's. But uh. <laughs> Well done. We'll have another episode on that, I think. Good, good. Oh, dear. <laughs>
Well, and then we get Trevor Hall takes us into Watts, it's Holmes's accomplishments, and particularly his knowledge of French. And at the time of the study in Scarlet, uh, Watson, you know, shows us Holmes having no knowledge of the French language and its literature. But by 1887, his knowledge of French was fluent, for he could hardly otherwise, says Hall, have foiled the colossal schemes of Baron de Maupertuis and outmaneuvered at every point the most accomplished swindler in Europe. And you remember he was brought home by Watson from the Hotel du Long in Lyon at the end of the case, you know, at a time when Europe was ringing with his name. And then in 1888, he demonstrated his knowledge of French literature. He quotes La Rochefoucauld to Watson in a comment on Inspector Athelny Jones, and he corresponds with François Le Villard of the French Detective Service. And we know from Watson's account that Le Le Villard wrote to Holmes in French. Holmes tossed over as he spoke a crumpled sheet of foreign note paper. I glanced my eyes down it, catching a profusion of notes of admiration with stray, magnifiques, a coupe de maître, and trois de force, all testifying to the ardent admiration of the Frenchman. Well, it's all Greek to me. (laughs) <laughs> uh yeah my my french is uh horrible but um let's let's not forget that again but watson a man of contradictions uh in the following year after these uh, uh wonderful uh congratulatory telegrams that holmes received uh has holmes misquoting flaubert mm. uh and this would have been in uh, the Red Headed League? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, well, yeah, which, again, th- this may be, may be Watson's lack of familiarity with the French. Right. I'm not necessarily convinced that it's Holmes. Right. Yeah, it's, and it's a tiny misquote. You know, it's the quote, you know, man is nothing and the work is everything, which he, which he says in French a little incorrectly. But... Uh, yeah. Well, and then, you know, just to put a cap on it, we're reminded by Hall that Holmes uh, successfully defended the unfortunate Madame Montpensier from the charge of murder, which hung over her in connection with the death of her stepdaughter, who was later found six months alive and married in New York City. And this is referenced in The Hound of the Baskervilles. And then there are other cases, the tracking and arrest of Hure, the Boulevard Assassin, in which Holmes gets an autographed letter of thanks from the French president and the Order of the Legion of Honor. So there you are. Yeah, lots of French connections there, uh, Mm -hmm. although none with Popeye Doyle. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So why don't we uh, pause here uh, for a quick word from our sponsor, and we'll come back and continue to talk about the erudition of Sherlock Holmes. Well, the Baker Street Journal, of course, is written in English, uh, but you can receive it all over the world. I know the BSJ is subscribed to by people from Canada and England and France and Germany and India and lots of different places. And uh, thanks to the Postal Service, which does have its delays here and there, people all around the world are the beneficiaries of the erudition of the authors in the Baker Street Journal. Um, This uh, 2023 year, uh, we're we're going to be seeing the first issue as uh, the spring issue. It'll be coming out in uh, the next few months under new editorship. Dan Andriaco takes the reins from Steve Rothman who finished up 23 years editing the Baker Street Journal, and I'm sure Dan will bring the same sensibilities to the Baker Street Journal that Steve did. Yes, absolutely. And the hallmark of the editor is the variety of topics that are in the journal, and it'll be interesting to see how Dan puts his own stamp on the Baker Street Journal, but I'm sure he will be carrying on Steve Rothman's appreciation of the variety because each issue of the Baker Street Journal 
doesn't just get into some of these details about what does Holmes know and what does Watson know in this. I mean, there are just lots of things. You know, there are articles about the chronology of the cases, about the actors, about Holmes and comic and graphic novels. It's a great range of things that make each issue of the Baker Street Journal just a treat to get. An absolute treat. And if you'd like to make sure that you are part of this regular treat, or irregular treat, as it were, just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and take out your subscription to the Baker Street Journal today. Okay, back talking about erudition. Uh, and I'm, I'm uneducated. What does erudition mean, anyway? I'd say your smartedness. Oh, I'm pretty smart. I'm smart. <laughs> Why don't I get respect? I'm smart. Not dumb, <laughs> like people say. I'm smart. <laughs> Thank you, Fredo. Um, <laughs> so, we talked about French. What about German? Yeah, what's about? Uh, <laughs> yeah? What's about German? Well, Watson, of course, credits Holmes with his knowledge of neither German, the literature, in any language in 1881. But by 1888, Holmes quotes extensively from, from Goethe on two occasions in sign of mm. four. Um, you know, he's quoting Goethe. He's recommending Winwood Reads, The Martyrdom of Man to Watson as one of the most remarkable books. He's become, mm. you know, a pretty good conversationalist. And, uh, you know, eventually Watson recognizes that in sign of four. He says, Holmes could talk exceedingly well when he chose, and that night he did choose. He, you know, I'd never known him to be so brilliant. He spoke on miracle plays, medieval pottery, Stradivarius violins, the Buddhism of Ceylon, the warships of the future. And, says Watson, he handled each as though he had made a special study of it. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, the, you know, a quick succession of subjects. We don't typically think of Holmes as being a generalist in his ability to converse, and yet uh, he would have had to have a wide range of knowledge uh, that reached certain depths in certain areas. But, you know, as, as a generalist, one typically has a knowledge a mile wide and an inch deep, uh, Holmes seemed to have knowledge, well, let's maybe say a half mile wide um, <laughs> and miles deep in certain very specific areas. Or a kilometer. We could say a kilometer. A kilometer, sure. Let's keep, well, it, this, is, this is Victorian England. The imperialism reigns, so let's <laughs> stick with the imperial system. Um, mm. But yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, now we're sort of on our skates. We're, we're heading towards the end of Trevor Hall's essay, The Erudition of Sherlock Holmes. And, and Hall says, you know, the years 1894, 95, and 96 offer us abundant evidence that Holmes was still searching for and docketing information for its own sake. Education, Gregson, education, he remarks to Inspector Gregson, uh, you know, in, in 1896, still seeking knowledge at the old university. Holmes says this in the red circle, and then he says, Ed education never ends, Watson. And Holmes had now made himself familiar with Shakespeare, although he does quote things, he does misquote things, you know, in varying forms, with lines like, lover's end, journey's end in lover's meetings from Twelfth Night, um, you know, which is just the misplacement of a word. It's journey's ends with lovers' meetings, uh, you know, and so on. And he quotes, of course, from Henry V, the game is afoot mm -hmm. in the Abbey Grange. Yeah, and, you know, I, I love this notion in uh, the Red Circle where he says, uh, still seeking knowledge at the old university. Mm -hmm. I don't think Holmes meant a literal university. He meant, the, I think he meant the University of Life. Um, taking things in and constantly being curious and absorbing knowledge wherever he could find it. Hmm. Um, but he did spend time in one of our great university towns, uh, that, uh, and that would have been in the Three Students. And uh, he was researching some uh, in early English charters <laughs> in that case. So he was getting into documents, and that would have required, uh, according to T.S. Blakeney, that Holmes must have had uh, an excellent command of Latin. Mm. 
which is a prerequisite of medieval research. Mm. Um, and you think of uh, Holmes's support of uh, the Pope, uh, looking into Cardinal Tosca, which I think was mentioned in Black Peter, and uh, his trying to get some Vatican cameos back. Well, of course, he would have needed to converse with the Pope in Latin as well, uh, at least in written format, one would imagine. Yeah. So, um, and, and we're uh, not too far away from the polyphonic motets of Lassus, which have been, uh, we, we discussed, uh, I, I think, over on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere with Anne Lewis. Um, uh, that would have required a knowledge of Latin as well. So we've got, we've got uh, French, we've got German, we've got, uh, uh, well, where do we get? Uh, yeah, uh, j- just looking into documents. You know, Holmes was widely read, ri- widely uh, spoken. Yes, yes. He mentions Hafiz and Horace and mm. Tacitus and so on. And, of course, when he's investigating the Devil's Foot case, he's there in Cornwall because he's interested in the ancient Cornish language. Mm. But but now at the end of his essay, um, Hall gets us towards the conclusion. He says, we have now, in discussing all these points, proved beyond doubt that at the university, Holmes was taught to desire and to acquire knowledge for its own sake. But where did he store all this knowledge? You know, we have this other comment that he makes early on about his brain attic. You know, how could he access these facts at short notice? Well, says Hall, what about that great index, Holmes's homemade encyclopedia, which contained much more material than the notes of his professional work, for those books were the record of old cases mixed with the accumulated information of a lifetime. And you look under the subject V, you know, now we've talked in other places about the odd classification system, but still in the section marked V, you've got vampirism in Hungary, vampires in Transylvania, you know, Holmes peruses these things, you know, finds finds these entries about vampirism to be, you know, a bit rubbishy. But he... uh, can find in other cases, um, you know, for example, the veiled lodger. Holmes threw himself with fierce energy upon his homemade encyclopedia, and having found what he wanted, sat upon the floor like some strange Buddha, with crossed legs, the huge books all round him, and one open on his knees. And that's how Holmes dispensed a good deal of his accumulated knowledge, by simply reading it out from his encyclopedia. Yeah, although you have to wonder about his ability to categorize them, because (laughs) recall in that volume of V, he also included Victor Lynch, Mm. (laughs) the forger. Uh, A little bit of an odd placement there. Mm. Um, Unless, unless, (laughs) unless Victor Lynch was a compound surname. (laughs) (laughs) And the venomous lizard, you know, the venomous yes. lizard is there too under V for uh, yeah. yeah venomous funny. lizard, that's a compound surname, right? Yes. <laughs> My name is Leonard Venomous Lizard, but <laughs> but you can just call me Venomous. Lizard. <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, in in the end, Hall tells us maybe the answer to all of this is Holmes' comments upon the remarkable intellectual capacity of his brother Mycroft and its similarity to his own. He says, Mycroft, you know, possesses uh, some of these talents in larger degree than I do. And, uh... Yeah, and, and of course we know that uh, Holmes uh, mentioned that they were of the Vernet family, art in the blood, of course, and uh, he, says, he says it's a reasonable inference that uh, Sherlock had inherited uh, from a line of country squires. Uh, the second tidiest and most orderly brain, with the second greatest capacity for storing facts of any man living. And of course, second to uh, Mycroft. And, and uh, his, his uh, Mycroft's specialty was omniscience, <laughs> and that in that great brain of his, everything was pigeonholed and could be handed out in an instant. Mm. So there we have it, uh, Trevor Hall's uh, take on the erudition of Sherlock Holmes. You, 
What's your uh, perception here, Bert, of this, uh, this essay, this supposition? In many ways, when you read enough of these essays, you begin to think of the mechanics of them, how things are put together. I think that Hall has uh, painted a great picture, looked at the subject from a remarkable different series of, of vantage points, dug into the canon. Again, to your earlier point, this is at a time before uh, concordance, essentially a digital concordance of the canon, you know, working uh, with uh, pencil and pen and paper into the canon. And I think the assembly of the argument is uh, magnificent. I really think it's uh, beautifully done. It, it really is. And, um, you know, having a, a pan-canonical uh, understanding of the stories, I think, is important. Because you can take any one of these instances and analyze it for its own. But really, when you look across the stories and across the relationship and, you know, take that chronological element, uh, it, it, it builds a case and you can draw inferences from it just mm-hmm. as... Holmes would in constructing his own deductions. Yeah. And that is no trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Sort of case sort of interested our old friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, indeed.